Well, thank you, Rachel, uh, as always, for organising this week's, uh, or should I say this month's webinar. Um, we'll just wait for everyone that has uh, registered. We've actually got a really uh, strong list of people who've registered for today's webinar. So we, we certainly hope that we uh, deliver uh, a good presentation today, something that uh, fulfills everyone's objectives and needs. Uh, I'm here with Gordon and Lou today. Hello. We'll do an official hello shortly, but we're just um, having a quick uh, chat before everyone uh, comes into the room. You can see on the counter down there, you can see how many people are joining in. Uh, so while that number keeps rising up as it is, we'll just uh, hold fire. Uh, the last webinar for 2021, I think it's fitting that we've decided to uh, to do this event today with Gordon and Lou, seeing so that they're uh, uh, very much a part of the Fontaine uh, Fontaine Multi Hole Solutions family, and a lot of people would have met Gordon and Lou at boat shows and events that we hold and uh, I'm sure a lot of people have seen their YouTube uh, video series as they uh, delivered their Elba 45 from France uh, down here to Australia. Um, also, there may be some confusion. When we first published uh, this event, it was going to be with Michael and Marita over there in Turkey. Uh, for personal reasons, uh, they, we just had to uh, make a shift there, but uh, a shout out to Michael and Marita and hope all is well for you guys. Um, but that's uh, that shift happened uh, about four or five weeks ago. So um, hence why we then reached out and said, Gordo and Lou, can you come and uh, help us with this event? Not that you're not that you're a second choice, Gordon and Lou. It's just uh, <laughs> initially this discussion had started with uh, Michael and Marita. And how are you both? Very well. Very well, Greg. thanks, Greg. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. to all that is watching. <laughs> yeah, I'm very happy to be here. We we love to um, share our story. It gives us a chance to relive it all, which is nice. <laughs> yeah, that's good. And I think uh, we've got quite a few people have joined in now. I think it's quite uh, important that we just make clear to everyone that with today's discussion and presentation, we're not in any way trying to announce ourselves as the... Uh, uh, as the only, as the, what would we say, Gordo? We're not trying to say that we are the, 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 the rule book on how to fit out your boat. This whole object, the objective of today's discussion is just to have a friendly chat about what we think would be suitable on to, to put on board your yacht uh, using the experience that Gordon and Lou have built up. And we're also going to introduce and, and steer those who are with us today towards other ways of finding out that information. But it, it, this is one of those how long is a piece of string type of discussions. So, um, and, and I think the best way for today's um, presentation to work is if those who are with us today can just keep throwing questions. And, and often what happens is other uh, people who are joining in with us in today's chat will actually type in the answer. So the answers might not necessarily come from Gordon and Lou and, and myself today. They might actually come from other participants. So this is a good opportunity to have a friendly, uh, fun Q&A and discussion with Gordon and Lou. Do, do you agree with that, Gordon and Lou? Yes, and there'll be a period at the end as well where we can uh, go through some of the uh, questions and give uh, reasonable answers as well. Very good. Okay, so as we said, this is our last webinar. Uh, we've been, I think this is now number 32. Um, so we will, um, uh, as always, uh, a recording of today's presentation will go up onto YouTube. Uh, you can watch that on the multi Hole Solutions YouTube channel or the Yacht Sales Co YouTube channel. Uh, and you can go all the way back to March, I think it was, or April in 2020 when we first uh, recorded our first webinar. So there's heaps there. Uh, the Multi Health Solutions YouTube channel also has a, a stack of other uh, videos and presentations that you can go and watch. So uh, it's a, if you've got nothing to do on a rainy day, it's a good place to go. Now, if you do want to ask a question today, down on your screen, you'll see a Q&A button. Simply click on the Q&A button, type your question. Uh, we will then either answer it as we're going or we'll hold it over to the, uh, to the Q&A at the end. And those who've joined us before with our webinars will know that we, 
we do a pretty good job of getting through most of the questions. So uh, we will we will give every question uh, equal weight. Um, then myself, Greg Boller, uh, the New York Sales Manager of Multi Hole Solutions. Uh, a, a shout out to everyone who's purchased a boat this year, whether it be a new yacht or, or a, a brokerage yacht. Uh, we've had a fantastic year. And obviously that's thanks to everyone involved. Thanks to Rachel and her team. Thanks to the Gordon and Louises of the, uh, of the world and our other ambassadors. And thanks to all the people behind the scenes at Multi Hole Solutions. We have had a great year. And a, a lot of people have made that decision to, uh, to purchase a yacht. And we've got a lot of people who are sitting there waiting now patiently for their boat to be constructed in, on the production line. Uh, and we'll eventually have that delivered to them. And at the moment, it's nice to know that certainly Multi Hole Solutions and Neil Trimarine, oh, sorry, Fontaine Vigeau and Neil Trimarine are generally uh, up to speed. So people are pretty much getting the boats uh, on time or maybe just a little bit late, but uh, certainly nothing drastic. Uh, today's presenters, Gordon and Louise Coates. Um, if you haven't met them uh, at a boat show or if you haven't seen them on the video, uh, I'll let you uh, just walk through these uh, little snippets of information here, Gordon and Lou, and uh, maybe explain yourselves. Okay, so uh, Louise and I met when uh, before marriage, actually, when we were racing on dinghies, um, married, and I was then working as a, a ground engineer, became a flight engineer, and then eventually transitioned to flying for many years, so 42 years in Qantas. Yeah, we've got a family now of uh, three beautiful daughters, five grandchildren. And back in 2006, we decided to purchase our first catamaran. We'd been playing around on other people's boats for years and uh, took the plunge and we bought the Arana 44, which we imported into Australia and had that for four years, so on the East Coast. Uh, the second, when I sold, I was retiring actually, 2010 and 2011, we decided to sell the boat and they bought out the new model Helia that replaced the Arana and we purchased probably before it was even really up there and in, in the public eye, but we waited until uh, 2013 to pick it up in the spring. So we were sailing out of the factory in La Rochelle down into the Med and that, that we did that for uh, two seasons in mm. the Med. Live aboard for six months and then come home for six months each year. And we crossed the Atlantic, did the Caribbean, British Virgin Islands, Bahamas, East Coast of America. And unfortunately we had to come home for a period and eventually we sold the boat. So we were boatless for quite a few years, still working as ambassadors and, and appearing at boat shows. And um, Mark Elkington, the uh, principal of Multi Health Solutions, he approached us with the news of a new 45, uh, the Elba 45. So that became our next, um, adventure yeah and we wanted to continue our journey um, our intention was always to say that we've sail sailed a boat from France to Australia and as Gordon said we'd only managed to get as far as the United States and so we thought well this is our opportunity we'll do the Pacific do it again mm. yeah so we crossed the Atlantic we did the pickup in uh, in their winter which was a bit unusual because it was hull number one it had done three boat shows for Fontaine at Cannes, Genoa and Barcelona. We picked it up at a place near Saint-Tropez and then we left there in November with ice on the deck. <laughs> it was cold. <laughs> Sailed to uh, Gibraltar and picked up the gentleman there you can see raising his glass on the image, uh, Steve Barrett and he and Luis and I sailed it across to the Car Caribbean via um, uh, the Canary yes. Islands. So that was uh, the beginning of our adventure, bringing the FP Elba home. And then we came across the Pacific with the outbreak of COVID. So that then curtailed our cruising in the Pacific. So we were then told to come directly to uh, Tahiti, which we did. We escaped Tahiti after three days and uh, we're told to go directly to Southport. And again, we did that. And that was uh, part of the journey home of 90 days of actual sailing to bring the Elba in. But COVID's played havoc with you and your yacht, hasn't it? Because um, as we know, <laughs> you, you 
kindly sailed the yacht up earlier this year so that we could have it on display at the Sanctuary Cove Boat Show. And then um, it's right, isn't it, that only about a week ago you finally got your boat home after the, the boat show in May. Correct, yes. The yes. boat was a little holiday in Queensland, but we were not. <laughs> but I mean, the boat was being used by uh, the multi-hull team and, and I mean there were quite a few I suppose visitors that have a, have yeah, a look at the boat, had the opportunity, had the opportunity to see it and uh, the multi-hull solutions team up there actually looked after our boat beautifully, it's uh, presented like a brand new boat again. Very good. Now what we'll do is I'll just uh, step through this. Um, as we said this is just a, a, a friendly chat today. Um, and we wanted to just let everyone know that we would consider that there's a number of other resources or areas where you can expand on the information that you need to work out how to fit out your new yacht. Uh, in this day and age, it's incredible how much you can find on social media. Uh, we were just talking before the webinar started about uh, for, like with the Elba 45, the Fontaine Joe Elba 45, there is a group uh, Facebook group called Fontaine de Joe Elba 45. It is a public group and the wealth of information uh, that has now been accumulated on that site alone, on that Facebook group alone is just incredible. Um, so yeah, there's plenty of plenty of groups. There's also other groups that where it's, um, you have to be approved to join in uh, the Facebook group, whether that be the Tenor 47 owners group or Elba 45 owners group. And that's where generally it's the owners by themselves or people who are waiting to purchase or have purchased and they, they are able to talk and exchange information privately in those groups. So you can learn lots from there. Uh, forums, uh, they're, every, they're also quite popular in some respects. Uh, the forums are strong, but probably being overtaken a little bit at times by the social media page. The good thing about the forums is the wealth of wealth of information. Uh, one that comes to mind for me is one called Noon Site, uh, which I know Rachel uh, in, uh, uh, gets involved with. Uh, that it has a wealth of information. Obviously, sailing schools and training centres. Um, they're dotted around Australia and around the world. Uh, so you can also obviously go to the sailing schools and training centres and they have the RYA related information or they'll have the, um, the, the different information relating to what you have to do to get your boat uh, into the right shape for the different style of cruising that you're looking for, whether that be coastal cruising, whether it be just weekend sailing or whether it be ocean crossing. Shipyards uh, and all the contractors and the people in the different boatyards are obviously full of information. Sales consultants, yes, you can believe a salesman. Um, <laughs> and then groups and associations, and I think that's a really strong one there. The Down Under Rally is just an example of the, uh, the, and the amount of resource and information that's stored in the brains of the people who are involved in those groups is fantastic. So there is so many different ways to fill your brains with the information you need to fit out your boat. And then there's <laughs> you talk, yeah. No, I'm just saying. And then there's Google. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Okay. Now I'll uh, let you have a talk through this slide, Gordo. Okay. Well, one of the first points you come to is the type of boat to suit your needs so, or your plans. Um, now we, we're referring back to our well before five for our plan was to go cruising and to do blue water cruising. So not everybody wants to do that. It may be coastal cruising, which we did with our Rana. So we didn't want to have all of the uh, glossy options that you need to do uh, to be remote and independent offshore blue water cruising. And we wanted something that was uh, small enough that just the two of us, we could, we could manage by ourselves, but big enough that we could have other people come and join us and, uh, and the family, of course. Yeah. And about to cope with the conditions you're sailing into, you know, you can go inshore cruising, you go out in the open. So you're gonna need a different style of vessel, maybe slightly different. You might want a performance catamaran, a, a, high, a higher, you know, higher speed performance boat, but Not then you can't, yeah, but then you start complicating um, things a little then. 
that depends on your age group. See, I'm 70, so you're getting into, you've got, you've got the younger sailors that can handle the physical side of some of the other boats. So yeah, where are you going? That's the question you want to ask. And uh, for us, uh, factory uh, delivery, it was to do the Mediterranean, but then cross the Atlantic and the Pacific. So yes, you're looking at offshore blue water cruising. And, and, and just so while you're on that, we will, uh, as we go through today, folks, we're going to give you an update about what are the current lists of options and, and, and uh, factory fitted and post factory styles of options. What's the general, you know, what are people talking about at the moment when they're buying boats to fit them out for that around the world cruising? Uh, right. And then we'll also have a chat about the, the coastal. Mm. And who are you sailing with? So it's husband and wife, which is more often than not the cruising couple. Um, and that's something you have to be uh, happy with, you know, be able to comfortably manage this boat, like we've said, on your, uh, as a couple. Uh, then it comes to displacement. So your maximum load you can carry. Now, uh, for us on our Elba, it was three and a half metric tonnes. Uh, other boats uh, vary. You get your high performance boats for the narrow hulls. I mean, they can carry a, a certain amount, but for cruising, you want to add your washing machine, you want to add your generator, you want to add a few other options that give you comfort while you cruise. And it can turn some of the narrow hulls into, now it, it brings it back to a more of a performance, which has been reduced a little. So you just got to balance that out with this yeah, choice yeah. of boat. Yeah. So um, Gordo, can you hold up? I think as an example, you've got a little document there that for instance, you got from Fontaine de Joux, the little booklet. and 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 for every boat that's built or designed and then built, there is a, a light displacement. So there's basically, right, this is the net weight of the boat before you load it up with people and fuel and equipment and so on. And then, then the, the, the designer has also said, and this is the maximum weight, the gross weight. And in between that is, as you just said, it's about three and a half tonnes on the Elba, right? Correct. Yes. So, so, so it's important for anyone watching today, no matter which boat you have, is to if you don't know, is to find out what your light displacement is and then what your maximum load is in terms of what is the what is the capability of your boat in terms of how much gear and equipment you can put on board. Correct. Yeah, so, you know, you can get all that from your sales team. You'll also get that on online as well when you do your research looking at these boats. But, uh, yeah, it varies. The larger the boat, of course, the more weight you can carry. Um, but as I said, the... Different styles of uh, boats come with different hull uh, uh, shapes that allow you to either carry a lot or not. And that's the performance, comes into the performance of your vessel as well. And one other point on this too is, you know, for instance, with Fontaine de Joux, we have sometimes you'll have a client say, oh, listen, I want to fit an extra fuel tank or I want to do this. Yes. And you, you, we might say to the factory, oh, look, this person, and the factory will say, well, you know, we can't actually... We, we can do this and this, but we can't do that because that would be voiding or that would be compromising the, the uh, approval, the, the, um, the certification that the factory is. So the factory has designed the boat and then they've certified the boat with the relevant authority. And so there's all these different factors to come to, to put into, uh, into thought before you're just loading up your boat with equipment. Yes, and, and that, those categories are important because... Um... It comes yeah, back safety. to the uh, safety of the vessel then. And uh, some companies don't actually comply with all the uh, that certification. They do it a different way. Uh, but FP, uh, they do categorise their boat to be able to go out and handle, um, you know, six, seven metre swells and, and, and perform safely with a, a, a load on board that they rate for that vessel. So you've got to be uh, mindful of that also, yeah. Very good. And I think it's important that we've covered that before we go, uh, start diving into this discussion today. And that uh, there again, it, sorry, Greg, that image there is uh, Lou preparing a meal on the Elba 45 on our way across the uh, Pacific. <laughs> Very good. You could be in, uh, you could be just off the coast of Sydney there. It looks very nice, Lou. <laughs> well, it's a comfortable boat. <laughs> okay, so I'm trying to change slides. There we go. Okay, so let's start with the basics. And I think when we were doing a, a read through of this the other day, we realized that the most important thing to put on the first page of 
the basics is the, is related around safety and personal safety and the, and the vessel safety. So I'll let you talk through that, Gordo. Okay, so uh, choosing your uh, life jackets and harnesses, I don't think you should compromise with life jackets. Uh, you can go and get an in, inshore style of jacket, but to be honest, if you're going to sit in the water for hours on end, you want to have an offshore rated jacket, which has a, a hood and uh, it's rated to uh, protect you in those sort of conditions. So yeah, a really uh, a quality life jacket that's comfortable to wear with the built-in harness is uh, what we'd recommend. Uh, deck jack lines, you need those really for safely moving around, especially at night time. We had rules that we all had to follow on board, which was to be clipped on and to have other people watching also with your jacket on to move around on the deck of the boat at night. Particularly at night. Yeah. Particularly at night. And um, we, on our jackets, we carried personal EPIRBs, which are okay, but in the open Atlantic or open Pacific, you're a long, long way from any um, immediate rescue with a personal EPIRB, but a personal AIS is, is very helpful because it gives other vessels the opportunity to actually see you in the water on their chart plotter. It comes up on their, on any boats that are nearby can pick you up. So uh, and that's a good one. And the Danboy systems for immediate rescue as well to deploy those, have that safely on your uh, rail or handy by to deploy. And uh, for us, we were carrying a long stay, what they call long stay uh, life raft, which gave us the uh, safety we needed on the Atlantic and Pacific crossings. So there are things that you have to sit down and work through and they, it, they are very important to have the right equipment on board, to know how to use it, uh, keep it update, updated, especially your EPIRBs and things, and um, to check batteries, et cetera. Uh, the life rafts have to be inspected after so many years. So there are things to be aware of when you're uh, setting it up, but they're basic must haves really for, uh, for, for, for cruising. And of course, and, it, and it's not written down there, but in the picture, of course, the other thing is your personal uh, clothing, you know, the wet weather gear, oh, boots. Very important. Um, yeah. yeah. So, you know, make sure yeah, you've got that at the top of your list of things to go and purchase as you're fitting yeah, out your new also bike. Something I forgot to mention there too is, is uh, especially if you're going offshore, to have your first aid equipment. Now that's very important. We had first aid training uh, before we went, but to have the equipment on board to actually carry out um, what is necessary? You, you can explain that. Yeah, problem. well, you can buy very comprehensive first aid kits for um, open ocean crossings, and they are very comprehensive. But uh, what we actually chose to do was to get advice and um, and put together our own kit. And we, yes. we put the kit into two large Pelican cases, so it was completely uh, waterproof. And two, because we knew that we could grab those and take them with us if we, were, we needed to. But for us, I, I felt that uh, purchasing those things and putting them together ourselves, we knew what was there. We yes. learned how, how they were to be used. And uh, thankfully, we didn't have to use too much. Uh, I think it was just a few bandages when I had a little accident with a knife. Oh, that, you would have had you would have had fishing line burn on your hands, wouldn't you, Gordo? Oh, <laughs> all the time, Greg. <laughs> and just to mention, out yeah, well, we were lucky. Our daughter's a, a trained nurse and sister, yeah. and she was help, helping us as well. And I've got a brother who's a doctor, so we had a lot of help we with had our a lot setup. Of advice. Yeah, but it, it's nice to have the equipment. I mean, you, hopefully, you don't have to use it, mm. and you can also get instruction from shore to you, providing you've got the right comm system and uh, they can talk you through as well. Yeah. So that's a, that's very important. But the other one that is important as well is your personal medication. See, um, uh, I've got a condition where I can get ill very quickly and if I don't have the proper antibiotic, it can, it, it, be, very dangerous it can be very dangerous. So. 
you've just got to make sure you carry enough uh, antibiotic or like equipment medicine for yourself you know just make sure that you're looking after your own health as well in that regard when you when you're stocking your boat setting it up all right very good and the other one we missed there because i hadn't clicked through with powerful torches which is obviously a must have as well so that's fine so that's a good page that's as we said we have to start with safety uh it would be ludicrous not to and then the next one of course is navigation so you know the community so you've got safety and communication so if you're fitting out your boat it's nice to talk about all the fun toys and the fun bits but we've got to uh, focus in on safety and navigation and electronics first so over to you lou or gordo okay well we found the iridium go uh, to be an amazing resource on board that gave us <clears throat> uh, our emails our talk and text and also tracking. So families at home or whenever could follow us on the tracking as well. So the, and downloading the weather, like we could do group downloads reasonably easily with the uh, system using our iPad. And that was all the way. I mean, there were no places that we- In the world we missed out. We missed no, out on no. any of that information, which is rather amazing, isn't it? The technology today is uh, incredible, keeping you safe. And you can get uh, what they call an unlimited plan through uh, Predict Wind or whatever. There's a group of people you can go through to get all these uh, systems set up, the Iridium Go system with your cards, your SIM card. And um, you can just have it turned on for the period you're travelling for a month or, or two months or whatever. And then you come home, turn it off, and then you go back and restart your system again and get into a new plan. But Weather radar, we had that on board. Uh, I must admit, we didn't use the weather radar a lot. It's very helpful around shorelines, I think, and operating into some areas where you have heavy fog and conditions like that. But and, us, and I think that that comes into this point of coastal or, or ocean. It's really yeah. interesting there because if you're coastal cruising all the time, it's a must have, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. But out in the open blue water, you know, you can see squalls coming, but when you're doing eight, ten knots, you can't outrun these some of these squall patterns and things. But it's nice to know they're there, especially at night, and you can prepare uh, your sail uh, configuration to cope with that, which we did on our first Atlantic crossing. We had that uh, option using the radar. Um, the iPad, we opt for the iPad and you must get the Wi-Fi cellular model, which is, uh, it, it, it operates independent of cell towers to give you a GPS position. That's what the cellular, uh, Wi-Fi cellular setup gives you. It's a little bit dearer, but uh, you can load up then with your Navionics, say, charts, and there's your backup nav system. You've got a position on board. And also that gives you your communication and weather grid file and et cetera, et cetera. You've got a lot of functions with the iPad. It, it really is a, a clever tool on board. And with the Garmin system and Raymarine, they have these apps now where you can actually sit and go to bed and look at it on your iPad or wherever in the boat and, and drive your boat really, the autopilot and watch your maps and see what's happening. So you're always in touch with what's around you with that. And we always carried paper maps too, didn't we? Paper we did. We, we had charts, but mainly passage planning charts in the end. Um, in the med, we did have more precise charting, but in the open ocean, we just used passage planning charts. It was. This is a really interesting one because just yesterday, on I, I think it was on Facebook, there was a, there's a group called Sailing and Cruising, and it was funny on there. There was that discussion: Do you still need paper charts? And it's the jury is it's a 50 50. You know, there's those of us who will always probably still want to take a paper chart on a boat and have it there just to put a mark on. And others are saying, well, Why on earth are you stuck in the old age? Just use the electronics. So it's an interesting one, the paper chart discussion. It came in handy, the paper chart, when we did our first Atlantic crossing because we went with a group um, called the um, Odyssey, what Atlantic, was it? Atlantic Odyssey. Odyssey group. Jimmy Cornell. With yeah. Jimmy Cornell. And there were 32 boats in that group. And we all set off at once. And um, it wasn't a race, Greg, it but it had a start line and a finish line. <laughs> but every day, the, um, the group organizers would send coordinates of where all of the other boats are. Yes. Every day, it was a highlight for us that we would 
get our, our chart, which we had underneath some uh, plastic cover. Uh, plastic on our, overlay over the uh, on our outside. Oh, panel. Oh, oh. And we would plot where each of the boats were yep. and where yep. our coordinates were. were. And um, But you weren't racing. No, we weren't racing. <laughs> <laughs> it became obvious very, very early that we were way in front. We had... Yeah. <laughs> We'd made a very uh, interesting decision to sail out to a weather pattern where everyone else decided to stay safe and go straight down towards the Verdes before they yeah. turned into trade winds. But we went hunting for a low, which we found, and that took flying across. <laughs> yeah, and we had beautiful a beautiful, sailing. we had beautiful sailing, two reefs and everything. But we were moving; we were doing twelve to fourteen knots. All right, so. No, sorry to interrupt. So what we're doing, we're going to jump ahead, just some a little bit conscious of time. So um, also, we've got quite a few people here with us today, but no one's asking questions. Don't be afraid to ask a question, uh, but we'll keep pushing along for now. So Gordon and Luke, but basic must has the next thing we've talked about there is sale wardrobe. I don't think we need to get too hung up on this page, so I will just might just jump through it if that's all right. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously, your boat normally would come standard with the mainsail and a Genoa or a jib. Um, Jenica is then normally a, an option that you have with your boat, which in these days also includes obviously a bowsprit and uh, uh, an equipment for your Jenica. Spinnaker or parasailer, as we can see in the picture there, although I will come, I'll cut to you in a minute, Gordo, about that picture and Lou. Um, and then, of course, you can consider upspecking your primary sailcloth materials to hydronet or similar. And on your Elba 45, I know you uh, were lucky and fortunate to have the hydronet sails, which we now call the offshore sails, and they have lasted really, really well. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, you can consider, uh, as we often experience with uh, owners who are buying new Fontaine Bajos and Neil Trimarines and so on, there's always discussions around around replacing main sheets and main halyards and, and Genoa sheets and changing the turning blocks. So when we talk about fitting out your boat, it's not about just putting equipment on board. It's also about having a look at the function of the boat and because of prior experience, because of um, advice from others, we often will have people who go, look, we really want that boat. We really like that Elba 45, but we want to change the, the jammers here. We want to add a jammer there. We want to put a a different turning block there. And so people will customise or, or, or personalise the sail controls on the boat to suit their requirements. And it's becoming more and more common that people are asking as a post factory or as an after the purchase uh, addition to their to their specification, uh, making changes around, around the whole sail control uh, running rigging aspect of the boat. In terms of the sails, we don't have to get over complicated on it, but basically you need to have a good upwind wardrobe, uh, you know, uh, the right sails to go upwind and then you need your right reaching wardrobe and you then obviously want to have your right downwind wardrobe. And mixed into that is then the discussion about sails for each of those aspects of sail, depending on the wind strength. So if you really want to get complicated, you can end up having more sails on the boat than people. <laughs> um, but uh, and it's again that's a classic how long is a piece of string discussion but in, in keeping with this presentation today about fitting out your new boat part of fitting out your boat is thinking and considering about your sail wardrobe so over to you to talk about that photo Gordo okay that image is the end of that 34 or there were 33 or 4 boats but the Atlantic Odyssey in 2014 and we sailed, that's the Helia 44, with the parasail up on the right. And this uh, Italian Halberg Rassi um, uh, boat, German Frias, isn't it? Design, yeah. It was chasing us all the way across the Atlantic. And we actually waited for him at the base of the island of Martinique so we could cross the finish line together. But because we had been you know, in front the whole way, they uh, we we decided we were going to make sure we crossed the finish line the before him. The in the spirit, <laughs> <laughs> so that's the, uh, the the parasail, and we uh, sailed that on our cat without any other sails up. It's a very very forgiving sail in the right winds. And uh, we've just bought our Elba four five down from Queensland, like I said last week, and again we 
um, we had the opportunity, had the opportunity to put the uh, parasail up and it just gives you a, a lovely comfortable ride when you're running downwind. But one of the conditions you met talking about um, these sails is cruisers don't go into wind, Greg. Um, <laughs> ideally, <laughs> you fire sail off the wind or downwind. And this is another point I want to make about choosing the right time to do those big crossings if you are going blue water. Because we've just done that 90 days of sailing and I would think, what, 90%? Oh, yeah. was the downwind mm -hmm. and that was choosing to cross in the trade wind season and that's uh, and that's where your journeyka uh, and we can across the pacific actually virtually on the journeyka and the main mm -hmm. uh, and across the atlantic was actually 16 days from the canaries to martinique was done just under the spinnaker we had no other sail up we pulled the spinnaker up as we departed lanzarote and that was the sail that stayed up for 16 days and nights. And we pulled it down as we turned into Lamarin. So, yeah, it depends on the weather and the conditions you're sailing in. But that's the uh, story with that little um, photograph there. <laughs> okay. So now, as I said at the beginning of the presentation, with the Q&A session today, or with the, you know, the Q&A button, uh, it, this isn't just an opportunity for people to ask questions. It's also to give information. Uh, Colin's given a great bit of information there saying that he also wears a Swit Lick, that, that's S-W-I-T-L-I-K, one man life raft. Uh, so, and he said, did you consider that as part of your personal safety? So um, I won't necessarily throw it across as a question, but it's really important that people know that there's such a product out there and that people are, are wearing them. So that's a S-W-I-T-L-I-K, one man life raft. Uh, Colin has thrown up there as a, an option for uh, safety equipment. So thanks for that. Keep them coming. Um, I'm going to flick the page now just so we don't get bogged down, Gordo and Lou. Uh, so the next one is now we're getting into how to live on board comfortably. So we've gone from safety. We've gone through, we've gone fairly quickly through navigation and electronics. Uh, we've talked about sales and now let's start being comfortable. So freezer. Lou, this is for you. And the only reason I throw that to you, I'm not being chauvinistic, but I know in your YouTube presentations, you did a session on this. Yeah, yeah. Um, we felt that the freezer was a must have for the long passages, particularly. And also we experienced um, when we got to the Caribbean that there was a lot, um, a lot of areas there that were quite remote. So again, having the freezer there was terrific too. And of course, with all the fish that you catch, you can't eat <laughs> the same dish for a week. So it's nice to be able to put some into the freezer. <laughs> and we did. We did. <laughs> <laughs> now, my memory is from the video that you did, you were saying that you were well across the Pacific and you were still happily um, retrieving food from your freezer. Absolutely. Well, and, yeah. roll, and the fridge And the too. two drawers. They have yeah. that's yeah. quite amazing that refrigerator yeah. too. But I, I think um, most people that uh, you know I deal with, obviously we have many many owners who are buying the boats and fitting them out and picking them up from the factory or having them delivered in Australia, New Zealand, or Asia. You can never have enough refrigeration, can you? No, that's right. That's yeah. right. It's very handy to you know if you have got uh, rough weather, uh, rough conditions for a meal to be able to even take it straight from the freezer, something pre-prepared and pop it in the microwave um, and you're done. You don't have to spend time trying to balance over the cooktop. So yeah, the freezer. And what we do with a lot of our owners too, especially on the Isle of 40s and the Astro 42s, uh, because they might think that there's not quite enough refrigeration and freezer space up in the saloon some will then uh, opt to put an additional freezer in one of the cupboards or one of the spaces down in the cabins. So, you know, and that becomes their, their long-term freezer. Um, Bimini over the helm station, fully enclosed. Is this from experience? Yes, uh, a very important. Uh, when we picked our boat up, the uh, Elder 45, the factory, when they show at boat shows, do not have uh, Biminis or clears installed. So we insisted on at least having the Bimini, which we actually sailed that boat all the way home without clears around the cockpit area, but we had the helm station protected. 
Very, very important. Uh, and, the, and this this is a hundred percent true, for whether it be a mono hole, a multi hole, for any boat. If you're going cruising, you've got to have that coverage over your steering and helm station, oh, right? Certainly. Yeah. Do, yeah. yeah. Okay, cockpit clears and comfortable seating. So, um, you know, I've got a friend of ours who, who sail up and back to the Sundays and so on, and they, they seem to persist with sailing without any cushions for their bottom. <laughs> um, I don't know how they do it. Um, <laughs> first thing I want on, on a boat is comfortable seating. Uh, it's nice to have those nice teak, uh, you know, the teak cockpit seats, but they're even better when they've got a cushion on top of them. Um, and then cockpit clears, whether it be a monohull, well, uh, you know, on a monohull, it's more about spray dodges and so on. But on a, on a multi-hull, it's about the cockpit being enclosed uh, is, is really important. Especially in, in, in either in clement weather or seasonal, you know, winter or spring, the year. And sun protection too. You know, it's, it's really nice to be able to uh, shield yes. you from that sun. Yes, and so often, for whatever reason, don't know why, but whenever you anchor in the afternoons, a boat always seems to swing so that the stern of the boat is facing directly towards the boiling hot sunset. So shade down the, uh, sh an ability to shade the cockpit as well is also important. Correct, yes, it is. Oh, and then it's so important to have rod holders, fishing rod holders, and the thing we forgot to put there is drink holders. <laughs> and you know, FP and L, uh, they've come to the party with their boats. They do have drink holders uh, as yes. a, built in. It's part of the standard setup now. Yeah. So well, well, that's it, right in front of that photo there. That piece of timber in the foreground is the drink holder, isn't it? Yes. And there's one right on your right elbow there as you sit at the helm. Uh, there's yes. a, yeah, uh, where your gloves are. Yes. yes. Correct. Yeah, <laughs> but that's very good. And listen, while we're looking at that photo, another little feature that you've got going there is the fact that you've got the VHF handset there at the helm station, which yeah. I know with FP is an option, uh, but that's another really simple but important feature is to be able to just without having to run away from the helm into the nav station, you can communicate clearly right there at the helm station. Correct, yes. And, and again, talking about helm stations, having that semi bridge deck helm like they have on this model and others it, it is such a functional uh, and very comfortable arrangement and autopilot right there so that is good. one of the most important parts of your uh, setup really uh, that works non-stop when you're doing long range cruising and it is the third well the first mate really it, it has for us anyway and, and it's one of the yeah, one of the most important parts of your uh, setup. And that plays into, as I think we're going to get into further on, is the thing about spares, you know, yeah. to, to, to have the knowledge about what are the things that may are uh, most important to you and how do you make sure that you've got some redundancy around those items. So, Correct. Yeah. Okay. So, moving on. Uh, <laughs> now we're oh. getting really serious. Okay. Well, <laughs> So this is, and I, I'd like to, to break in here. And um, up until now, we've been talking about the different features, but this is amazingly, this is where so much of the sales discussion is now in, in terms of the, the boat sales process when we're selling our multi holes. Uh, it'd be interesting to find out from Bob Vinks if he feels it's the same around the mono holes. He's selling the G4 yachts. Um, but we then get into this whole comfort and livability aspect of, of basically how do we make a boat? How do we fit our yacht out so that in many respects, and I know that if this went into the public domain, we would get laughed at, but in many respects, how do we make it as homely as possible? So that you know, the, your power supply is reliable, that, that your um, water capacity is, is always uh, available. Uh, so uh, these these things are important and how to power your boat without running the engines all the time to charge your batteries, obviously the solar. Uh, you've also got wind, there's all different uh, now methods of, uh, of putting power into your batteries other than running an engine. Right. So to start with, we start with water makers. Um, at the moment, on all of our yachts, we're mostly fitting the aqua base, but I'm sure you're aware of there's a range of brands. 
the, the, the thing there around the water makers is you can either have a 12 volt water maker or you can have a 220 volt water maker. Um, the, obviously the latter needs uh, the generator uh, running to, to then uh, use the water maker, but the 12 volt water makers now where uh, Aquabase are doing 60 litre per hour water makers, they're doing 105 litre per hour water makers, and they're even now doing 180 litre per hour 12 volt water makers. So um, the ability to, to basically make water uh, is, <laughs> It's very different now than what it was even just 10 years ago when if you mentioned water makers, people would laugh at you because they were unreliable, they broke down all the time, but that's not the case anymore. No, we, we, we found that the, um, and, and for performance, for cruising, we tended to run with only about 70% max in our water tanks, just to reduce that weight at the bow of the boat, um, just to keep the boat balanced a little, but the, we had the 65 litre an hour, which for two or three on board, it, that's adequate. But 105, yeah, you need the larger capacity maybe running with a big family on board. Um, depending on what you're running too, our boat had fresh water toilet wash as well, or flush, sorry. So that, that you had to tend to watch your water use throughout the day. But having adequate solar there, you can see on that uh, image on the right, you've got a, an aerial shot of Louise on the sun deck, sun lounge there on the, uh, the 45. But that's a standard uh, company set up of 400 watts. Yeah, so that's only 400 watts. And yeah. I, don't, I don't think I've ticked that box for an owner once on an Elba 45. It, it, you really need that 1,000 plus and... It's easy to do that now with the uh, larger and more efficient panels that they've got, 400 watt panels, and you can put three of those very comfortably across the back. Additional battery storage. There are a lot of options there with batteries. Uh, now we're talking lithium and um, AGM. AGM is a standard from the factory. Uh, most people would probably start with that and then explore the lithium or those that are really uh, want to get straight into lithium have to uh, remove their AGMs and deal with that at the factory. But yeah, look, there is and that and that that space that space is changing quickly. I would I would think it's not too far away that uh, builders such as Fontaine Bajot and 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 the large monohull and multi hole manufacturers. It's not far away where lithium will be a, uh, always there as a specification option. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and so on. And just uh, to interrupt for a minute, the other one is someone just asked because it's in that picture. Can uh, you get a helm lock uh, as an option for Fontaine de Jo and Dufo? And the answer is yes. Even yeah. just uh, one month ago, we um, a gentleman fitted a, a helm lock to his Elba 45. So that's definitely doable. Um, solar, just a little snippets of information there. So I just, just this morning, I was doing a quote on that. It's about 8,000 euro for about 1.2 kilowatts of solar, including the additional stainless steel frame that needs to be constructed or, or fitted to, to keep, to basically fit them on the back of an Elba 45. Mm -hmm. um, Fisher Panda is the gen set there. Obviously the other big gen set models are Onan, uh, Cummins Onan. Um, there's also Northern Lights, so there's quite a number of brands of, of Genset. Um, the one thing about the Fisher Panda, I noticed that on the Tanner 47, which is a new model of Fontaine de Jo that's replaced the Sayona 47, on that boat they are fitting a Fisher Panda, and generally because they tend to fit into the space, they're a smaller package. Yes. Uh, okay. Well, yeah. So then we move along. Uh, that's your yacht in the Caribbean, that's, isn't it? Yeah, that was, um, I think that was in... Levy Martinique. Le, Le, no, that was back in um, Gibraltar, I think. Or was oh. it Martinique before we left? Yeah, probably in Martinique. That was on our way home. So one of the important things you should do, though, is to learn about your boat and its equipment. So the location of all your components that are probably important to you, and those are... Um, the water, uh, your, your valves in the hull, your sensors in the hull, so your um, uh, air mar, triducer, little things like this that you sort of want to know basically how to turn and close things on and off, where to switch your uh, circuit breakers. So on some boats, the circuit breakers are hidden away a little, 
and it's not easy to get access to them. But the ones that you can get access to are your anchor wind at windless breaker and your AC shore power with, um, breakers. Yeah, and again, we were talking about this earlier, the spares. So I think it's important to have uh, a reasonable knowledge if you want to do the offshore cruising, carrying, say, your basic filters for a service, one service maybe, impellers, and have toolkit on board to cover all these events. So you're going to have a, uh, a pretty comprehensive toolkit, really, because you're looking at some electrical work, you're looking at we had um, equipment on board to help with halyards of rope work, things like that, needles and bits and pieces to carry out repair work. So it, it's good to have a, uh, a little bit of knowledge there, but you can find all that in books and bits and pieces. So you'll be able to work things out at times, yeah. Sail repair kits? Yes, yeah, sail repair. Um, you can get some very clever products now to help you there, uh, just for doing temporary repair work. Yeah, so that's uh, an image of the um, platform and the tender on the Elba 4-5 as we were on our way home. We never put that in the water, by the way. It just sat on there all the way <laughs> from Europe. The tender. Yeah. The tender, yeah. All right, now we're going full, full Monty. Um, but uh, certainly in the, in the space that I'm in at the moment, these are all items that... Uh, <laughs> Are literally becoming must-haves. Uh, you know, often these are the boxes that get ticked first. Uh, generators and inverters. So uh, we had a question there from Bob. Do you have an inverter? We're seeing an increase in uh, we're seeing increased inquiry to fit a three thousand watt inverter, which can run the washing machines. The question is, Genstep is still preferred over inverters and solar. And that that's a good question. Um, you know, and let's not pretend we're all electricians here or, or gurus, but if we wanted to throw this discussion out to the group, at the end of the day, you've got to work out how you're going to harvest your power. So whether that is through your solar, whether that is through, um, I'm just having a mental block, but there's also the, the mechanisms now that drop out of the bottom of your boat, like a... a, a the Hydro, hydro vein, yeah, the, water. yeah, the hydro veins. Then you've also got, uh, I'm even hearing now where people are talking about electric propulsion, where the, uh, the propeller when you're sailing is spinning and putting power and regenerating power back into your batteries. Um, and then of course, if all else fails, it doesn't hurt to then have your diesel gen set because all you're doing is you're just trying to find ways of putting charge into batteries. Right. Once you've got the charge in those batteries, then it's a matter of how to use that power in your batteries. And that's where the inverters come in. And so we've got people who are, so the boats, you know, Fontaine de Joe's come stand with two, 3,000 watt inverters. Some people are fitting five or six or 7,000 watts of inverter. Some people are fitting 10,000 watts of inverter. So um, you can, you can rack up your inverter, but it's all, this is where the electricians and the, the smart people get involved about working out what battery bank capacity you have based on that what's the maximum inverter capacity that your boat can cope with or your battery system can cope with uh how much solar array you need blah 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 and all of that combined creates the perfect package and often that does include a diesel gen set at the moment agreed 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 and and from a practical point of view from from what we've experienced with our a non-stop 24 hour sailing, um, you don't always, you're not always going to get the solar. Um, you, at night you've got, especially in high, high temperature areas like the tropics, you've got you, your fridges and freezers are virtually working all the time. And, okay. and the auto helm, your nav system, your basic lighting. And we had to run the generator for a few hours each night just to keep that battery topped up. Yes. But once the sun appeared over the horizon, uh, we found we were getting quite a good charge that would keep the batteries topped up. But going back to your AC power, I think uh, you, once you start dragging out power for AC, you're starting to hammer into your battery. Um, and I found we found the, the practical way was with our Helia was a small gen set, was a five kilowatt panda. Yes. Uh, and that was enough to give us the microwave, the washing machine, the water maker. And we could do all that just by running that machine for a few hours. Yeah. And 
it sips diesel. It only sips at 0.4 of a litre an hour compared to running your engine. You're not running an engine. You're just running, well, you're running a little diesel engine. So it's very, very efficient. And it gave you that um, charge that you needed. So we used to do uh, the water making when we were running the washing machine. And we'd try and time it so that we only did the generator when we really needed it to keep those batteries uh, where we wanted them. But, you know, it was just a matter of managing it all. We've got a good question here from a gentleman called Bart. Why is boat solar so expensive compared to land, land or terrestrial solar? I don't know the answer, Bart, but hopefully someone out there amongst the group of people who are watching today, someone might be able to explain clearly why boat solar is more expensive to land solar. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I think the efficiency on the, the, the marine solar panels are very high. They're very efficient panels. Yes. Maybe it's the material they're using in to get the efficiency that's created that. And then um, someone did ask, and this is a good question, how often did you run the air conditioning on your trip from Europe to Australia? And I bet the answer is probably hardly at all. But what's the answer? Um, sort of. It, it was more when we were in the Galapagos area, like the equator, equatorial area, where yes. in the evening when Louise was going into the saloon and to cook an evening meal, it, it was just so hot, Greg, and to run the gas and the cooktop or whatever, it really got quite hot. And we just thought, well, why not cool our bedrooms down? We'll run the air and the generator, but we'll make some water and we'll charge back. We we'll did about four different things off the generator. Because the generator works best and under load. the generators, we had, had, this boat's got a nine kVA generator, which is a massive unit really. And they need to be run at um, up around 70%, 75% load to stay, efficient and functional otherwise you know you don't load up the generator you're going to damage the diesel engine will suffer over time so yes we did the so we did yes, we did we comfort. did yes. comfort and it gave us the cooling for the bedrooms prior to our um and it gave louise a cool uh, saloon to work in so yeah we did have it so just before we leave that one i also often say to owners and this is from my years of um operating the, the charter fleets is um Often the air conditioning is not for you, the person, it's for the boat. And whether that's when it's in a dehumidifying operation phase or whether it's just to, because yeah. the boat likes to not be hot and damp and sweaty either. It's not just the human. Now, listen, just another one is, um, and I did have it written down and then David has just uh, jogged my memory there as well. The other thing we have to mention at the moment, because it's all over forums, uh, is we've talked about solar, we've talked about um, all these different ways of harvesting power. The other one that's really uh, gaining traction and being talked about a lot and has been now tested and trialled by a number of boat owners in, in, from our side is Integral, uh, which is basically an alternator-driven solution. So it's basically, a, an, an, a, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's an enlarged alternator arrangement off the, off the engine. Um, and it's proving itself as well. Uh, to the point where it's even, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's got the capacity to, uh, combined with a lithium battery uh, arrangement, it's got the capacity to run all of your house, including air conditioning. So right. that's, that's another one just to keep in the back of your head is Integral and the, the alternator driven solutions because uh, it's not the only one, but they're, they're out there. Uh, and then washing machines dry, becoming a fairly standard part of uh, boat equipment now, believe it or not. Can you believe we're talking yachting uh, and we're talking washing machines and dryers and then air conditioning and heaters uh, and then coffee machines. Oh, and, a, and another, another one that's really beginning to get traction, and I can't believe I'm saying all this, is water filtration systems. So yeah. water, pu water purifiers. People are now fitting their water purifiers. So, and that's because they don't like to taste the water out of the boat so, uh, tanks. And I actually am a believer in water purifiers because it means you're not using plastic bottled water. You're not having to go ashore in your dinghy and grab big pallets of bottled water. You just put the water in your water tanks and, and uh, turn it into nice purified drinkable water. So it is good for the environment. Microwave oven? Necessity. <laughs> televisions? Uh, uh, television for sanity. We carried a lot of um, uh, 
what do you call them, the um, terrible external, four, uh, external hard, hard drive. And we had movies and TV series and bits and pieces on, yeah. Okay, so now moving along, uh, this is where you're saying, you know, let's stick to the topic here, fitting out your, your new yacht. Then there's the things that you, uh, I, can I hand over to you, Lou, to have a chat through this one? Sure, sure. Um, even though it's down in this there, podcast for me, and I loaded up an a, a, a I, what, um, what iPod. Do I use? a little iPod. I loaded up a little iPod with lots and lots of podcasts. And for me, doing a night um, passage and watch a night watch, that kept me awake. And uh, it, I actually got to the point where I was looking forward to each of my um, night watches so that I could continue with my podcasts. <laughs> Yeah, so um, as Gordon had said before, our external hard drive with movies and TV series, particularly when we were in um, in Europe and we couldn't speak the language that we found that a lot of people weren't understanding us, in the evenings it was actually nice to, to relax with a, a movie or a TV series in English. It just gave us a little bit of time off and um, relaxation. <laughs> Sounds funny, but it, it did. Um, the Imray pilot guidebooks. They were invaluable oh, in the med. Very much so. They give you so much information, not just in um, you know the, the shoreline itself, but also what? what the facilities were in each of the little villages that you came to and um, where, what was, where what was worthwhile looking at. Yes, exploring. The other thing I see that you've done there too in that picture and I think it's important is you can never have enough blankets and sheets and things like that you know just the way you've just got you know blankets over your cushions there you got spare blankets to throw around you've got cushions and pillows can never be enough to make that boat comfy hey absolutely, absolutely. yeah and and we had our own um Lou used to cut our hair yes cut hers and color it <laughs> so little bits and pieces that you probably don't you know, you've just got to think about, but just to keep it comfortable and make sure that... Uh, well, we realised how live. valuable they were when we were told we couldn't stop anywhere in the Pacific because of COVID. And suddenly the scissors and um, clippers came out and they were very, very much needed. <laughs> Rightio, then we come to the next page. And this is amazing. You know, we started out at the very front end there with the most important um, items. And here, as we get towards the end, we get to even more important items. Um, swim equipment, agreed. Snorkel, snorkel gear is a must have uh, also from a safety perspective. Uh, if you need to go in the water to untangle something, if you need to inspect your hull, uh, yeah. it's, it's critical that you've got snorkeling equipment on board any boat, um, yeah. no, matter where, no matter where you're sailing it. Um, adequate supply of sunscreens and suitable clothing, of course. Uh, wet weather clothing, we talked about that at the front end, uh, and your favourite tipple uh, to uh, have it um, as the, uh, what is it, as the sun goes over the yard arm, is that right? That's yeah. it, yes. Um, okay, so we're sort of there at the Q&A session now, and I'm happy to throw this open. One question we do have there, uh, Lou and Gordon, is uh, what material is on the floor of your galley and kitchen? Um, it's a, it, um, it's a, what, uh, I should know this, um, but basically it's just a laminate flooring, isn't it? Laminate yeah, veneer. Yeah, uh, yeah. It wasn't anything, um, yeah, it was just a standard fit. Mm. So um, come on, folks, we need some questions and answers here. Throw, throw some cues up and uh, we can have a chat. Otherwise, we're going to sign off and uh, let you all go off and uh, have your Christmas break. Um, but if you've got some questions, we've kept this light and simple. As we said at the start, it's really complicated when you say how to fit out your new boat. It's like, where do you start uh, and where do you finish? So we could have gone all technical and gone page after page of this is what you do if you're coastal, this is what you do if you're day sailing. But we just decided to pick one channel of thought. And that was let's have a chat to Gordon and Lou about how they fitted out their boat and what worked for them. Um, so, you know, and as we said at the start, there's a heap of other information and, and ways to find that information. 
Uh, someone just said, uh, thoughts of inflatable dinghies in croc country. Um, yeah, so th this is a, uh, a good thing, actually. It's not only inflatable dinghies these days, it's inflatable seats, it's inflatable fenders. Fontaine Bajot are now offering inflatable fenders as an option. Um, the, the idea, and th a lot of these things now are made out of the same material that you see the stand-up paddle boards are made out of. And the beauty of them is, is they wrap up into basically little bags, like sleeping bags, and you can put them away. So whether that be deck cushions, but inflatable dinghies in crop country, not sure, Peter. <laughs> I feel my name for that. <laughs> <laughs> and then speaking of sail plans, other than the main, the jib, the spinnaker and para, did you carry any spares? I don't um, think you did. No, we didn't. Um, we relied on the standard set. But what we did do, Greg, we actually um, rigged up a jury, rigged up a, vent, a preventer system for our main and our, uh, our genoa. And that gave us the option of running downwind without the spinning say. So we could have done both. And, and without at night time, we didn't run the Jenica because of the size of that sail and with only one person on watch at night. So we used to put the Genoa out and with the, the preventer. And that gave us the, because uh, we were running a beam wind, we had winds at around 140 degrees. So we were running on a, yeah, on a reach, really, a, a really deep reach with a, uh, the light trade winds at night with the main and main end head full. So no, we didn't have a lot of spare. We didn't carry spares. I know there's I, people carry so many sails on boats and the sails become so prolific that there's now even an organ, as a lot of people probably know, I know that for years there's now a business in Sydney called Sail Exchange. You know, and that's where basically uh, the guys just basically collect people drop off or sell their old sails or their unused sails and then you can ring up and you can go right I've got this I've got this halyard length I've got this and this and this have you got a sail that suits my boat so there's so many different ways if you wanted to buy a spare sail you might not necessarily need it to be a brand new one so uh, we've got a few questions coming in um, <laughs> uh, what's your next adventure and what would you do differently? So I hate asking that of you guys because it'll make you go, right, we're going. We're going. So <laughs> <laughs> you, you've you. got a growing family, so it's a bit Thank hard you. at the moment. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> um, have you got any thoughts? Is it coastal cruising for you guys for the next few years? Moment, At the yeah. moment it is. With our yeah. current uh, family situation around us, we prefer to stay closer to home just for the moment. Yeah. But Very good. Uh, we've, all, we've always wanted to tour the Pacific, so yeah. you never know. We may be uh, heading out that way. And, of course, COVID. I mean, that's, yes. that's made really... a, a difference to a lot of us in our planning. It's so, shackled um, a lot of people, yeah. really, around Australia anyway. Yeah. Okay, so now th this is good because we're not ready to finish this and we've just had a couple of really good questions thrown up. Well, really good questions. Um, the one is, I heard you say that you had freshwater toilet. Why? So I'll answer that one. So the first thing is, is a fact from with a lot of the new boats, you can choose to have either a three, three options. You can have a manual flush saltwater toilet. You can have an electric flush saltwater toilet or you can have electric flush freshwater toilet. Or um, you can actually have water fresh or, or salt. Yeah, too. and that's where I was heading. So um, what we often do is we actually will sell the boat to the clients with the electric flush toilet, salt water flush electric toilet. And the reason we do that is because when the boat is being built, it means that there is a hole uh, included with a, a, a through hole fitting and a seacock for the salt water pickup. If you order a freshwater toilet, then they don't drill the hole. Uh, so you don't have to pick up. And then what we then do is we offer an option for about 650 euros for people to then plumb fresh water to a Y valve with a, uh, a lever where they can have the boat normally always on freshwater flush using the water because you know if you've got a water maker then freshwater flush is totally it's totally achievable but in case you have an issue with your fresh water supply you can then just change over to salt water and the reason why people like a, a freshwater flush toilet rather than a salt water is because of the smell uh, salt water toilets if not managed properly or if left for a while without being flushed and 
and so on, they can get quite a uh, quite a mean smell to them. So and it's more the, the dying and bacteria that's the dying in the salt water when you leave it sit there for too long. Yeah. And there are treatments. I remember we had uh, a couple of years ago at one of the boat shows, we had a boat that had saltwater flush. And it is amazing how with the right treatment, you can fix that problem. But it's yeah. the best way to fix it is have freshwater flush toilets. Yeah. A bit extravagant, but nice. And then um, someone has said which of the many options that at Fontaine Bajot offer, and I'll say also do for, uh, did you do aftermarket rather than via the factory? Um, this is again, this is a whole webinar in itself, mm. but I'll let, I'll let you, yours was a bit different too, because your boat was already in um, Coggolin. With, but, with the Helia, factory pickup with the Helia, now that was back was in that 13, choice? that was, a lot of it was, um, uh, it was a mixture of factory options. And we didn't want the air conditioning. We didn't want the big generator. So we went with Fisher Panda and a small one. Again, save weight. So they, that was an aftermarket. But to uh, answer that, the Elba, no, we didn't have any um, say in the options on that boat. It came with virtually every option that Fontaine Peugeot could put on it. And we were very, very pleased. It's a beautiful boat. So, uh, but to answer that aftermarket, I would probably would be the solar that you were talking about, the additional solar. That'd yeah, be and, and I, I can probably rattle through this pretty quickly because I'm dealing with it every day with all our existing owners in waiting, the people who are waiting for their boats to be built. And we're currently constantly in the discussions and exchanges with them about what they're fitting or what they're wanting to have as post-factory versus factory. Mm -hmm. And you are 100% right. Solar is probably always post factory because the factory just doesn't deliver the right uh, amount of solar. Uh, upgraded water makers yes. is the second one. Uh, dinghies. Uh, yeah. So getting dinghies and outboard motors as a post factory because there's more choice. Yeah. Um, uh, the, um, then there's little things. It's like more PowerPoints. Yeah. Um, it's inverters. Um, it, the, the, and then you get into people who are going full lithium options, full integral power solution options. Uh, and then you just, it's a little stuff like jack stays, um, uh, anchors. So I, I don't think we've sold a factory supplied anchor in a long, long time because everyone wants to go and buy their, their Rockner or their, their alternative uh, Ultra. So, you know, so anchor and chain is most normally always done as a post factory item so it's yeah, quite it's, it's it's quite extensive uh air conditioning it's actually funny gordo now majority of people actually go through the process it's a bit like they go around a big circle they go we're not doing the factory factory uh air con and they go around 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 and they come back no we'll just do the factory air con because they've been on the forums and they've listened and they've read and they've realized that one thing that's probably smart to get the factory to do if you're going to have aircon just get them to do it it's a very expensive package but it's done and it's uh, well it's it's done and you're not taking up yeah. the time it's, waiting in la rochelle it's a time factor nowadays yeah mm. and then the other thing too is that people uh the big discussion is whether to go factory cockpit tent and clears or whether to go post factory cockpit tent and clears so there's so many different uh, discussions um but yeah i think we've covered the main items there mm, correct okay so on that note um i think we might bring this one to a close uh, probably the most i've spoken in a webinar for a while um Thank yeah you. <laughs> good, good, good to have some time with you both um have you got anything to add oh we're just looking forward to some more sailing time yes. <laughs> now that We've got Back this. Home, we've got um, this wet summer with us, but yeah, and we'd like a few more of those days out. We shared with you, Greg. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So no, it will be good. And um, I'm I'm fortunate enough in uh, on the 11th of December, I'm actually sailing a mono hull, uh, a G4470 from uh, Brisbane down to Sydney. So that will be fun. I'm actually, am I allowed to say that? Yes, yes. We we're allowed to. Uh, we've got a permit to go and pick up this boat, go straight and pick up the boat and sail it because um, it's for work um, but yeah so we'll be uh, I'm going to go sailing looking forward to that haven't been on a tilt show boat for a long time 
Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can't remember what that tipping over is like. Uh, Bob Vinks from uh, G4 has uh, wrote me into that one, so I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Um, and then uh, next year, we're looking forward. What's really exciting is in January, we've got the first Neil 43 coming into Brisbane on the ship. So we're going to be launching that and be uh, hopefully going and doing some test sailing and we'll have a, an open for inspection event in probably, I'd say it'll be February now. And that will be with the Neil 43 because that will be the Australian premiere of the Neil 43 and it will be with the Isle of 40 because we're having the first Isle of 40 to arrive in Australia is coming on the same ship. So we've got two new models that we'll unveil. Uh, and then I think not long after that, we've also got the MY4S, the power boat. So got, uh, got some exciting stuff happening there at the start of the year. And then we'll then, uh, we can't wait in March, we've got the Auckland boat show. So the boat shows are back on. Excellent. And then in May, uh, we'll obviously all do the Century Cove show again and then wedged in there in April if, for those who are game enough who want to travel overseas uh, there's the Le Grand Mot boat show in, um, in, in France and the reason that show is important is because that'll be where they unveil the, the new 51 the 51 foot uh, Fontaine de Joe. so there's quite a bit happening at the start of the year oh and sorry and combined in there the first week of January is the, uh, is the the return of the uh, Thailand yacht show in Phuket. Okay. So, yeah, so things are turning on again, which is great. Where does the MY4S arrive into, Greg? Uh, I've got to watch myself here. I'm pretty certain it's coming into Brisbane. Yes. Brisbane. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so that's all good. Okay. All right, then. So um, have a uh, fantastic um Christmas and New Year and thanks to everyone who's been tuning into our webinars for the last 18 months while we've endured COVID. Um, it's, been, uh, it's been an interesting slog, but I think what's been great for Multi Hole Solutions is that we've generated and built up this massive library of resource now, uh, of which you guys have been big contributors to that. Uh, I think our other big contributor is the guys from Down Under Rally. Uh, have been fantastic over the last couple of years. So anyway, so thank you, Rachel, in the background. Uh, you've been fantastic. Thank you. Have a great Christmas with your family. And to Gordon and Lou, thank you so much. And also have a ripper Christmas with your family. Thank you, Greg. Thanks, and Greg, you. and to you uh, and Kel and, the, and your little family. So, yeah, we look thank forward you. to uh, catching up in the coming year. Yes, yes. I'm, uh, I'm off to Martha's Cove next week down in Melbourne, uh, where we've just uh, launched a new Elba 45. And later next week, if anyone is listening who wants to, uh, we will be um, having a uh, showing of that boat. Where just a, a, I'll be on the boat for a day sitting at the marina. If people want to come down and have a look at the new Elba 45, they can. Enjoy that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, folks. Thank you. All the best. Thanks, Greg. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye.